hello everyone. Um, thank you, Tom, for inviting me here to this uh, work to this uh, spring school, and as I understand, also a little meeting of the uh, local Wageningen R user group. Some people are here. So uh, I'm not in um, I'm not in soil science. I, I, I did you know did some I know a bit of soils and did you know made my hands dirty at some stage. Um, while studying and, and did some soil physics courses here, but it was really in the in the 90s, so I will I will not talk about anything about that. Um, but there is a lot of there are quite a few of people working with soil science doing uh, courses, programs like this, and using a lot of R, and they end up using all kind of tools uh, for using all kind of tools for that, uh, to which to some extent I am responsible for. Uh, for uh, developing, as with, of course, with many other people. Uh, and today I was planning to, uh, I was, I'm hoping to um, talk a bit about some uh, new developments that recently took place and that we are actually uh, planning to uh, uh, have happen this year. Yes. Um, so, so who of you has heard of the phrase simple features? None of you, okay, good. Then we start there. Um, who of you has heard of the phrase Open Geospatial Consortium? Right, quite a few. What do they do? What does the Open Geospatial Consortium do? Or who are they, these people? Right open source kind of things who can be more specific data and downloading things and open source kind of things who has more yes I think they also set standards for formats, formats. right they set standards for the exchange of spatial data really uh, and you know you you would rather hope that they would do things with open source but they set the standards and standards doesn't mean that there is an open source implementation sometimes there is sometimes there is not and uh, so, for instance, R is open source software, but it's not a standard. It's not a formal standard in the in the sense of a standardization body like ISO standardized it or something like that. Nevertheless, it turns out to be pretty useful. Um, so OGC came up with the idea to think about okay, what are these things that we have in the world, right? That we want to sort of characterize that that in the end, when represented in the computer, convey data, and they call these things features. Yes whether that is a good idea or not. I mean, the word thing is also pretty vague. Yeah? So they call them features. And then they came up with a way to uh, describe features, to describe things in the real world. And they said, OK, features have you know, properties and have like a, a place or have a geometry. Right? And this geometry is then described by simple features. Um, in At least simple features is a standard for describing geometry of things. And the standard is uh, like basically has uh, only. Can I write on that on that paper thing here? Is that possible? Yes. Okay. The standard basically says okay, geometries. Well, of course, you know, geometry can be like a point. Yes, with an coordinate. Yes, so for instance, latitude and longitude in some coordinate reference system. It can, for instance, be like uh, a set of points. Yeah, that is called a multipoint. So I have a couple of points. These points are, for instance, uh, uh, the, the soil samples that I have on this particular pot soil or something like that, or, or the places, the locations of, of the, my car fleet that I have. And there is another point set that is uh, here, that is another car fleet. Um, they can be lines, and lines are basically sort of points connected by uh, straight line segments. Yeah, that, is, that makes a simple feature simple. That the, that we have a linear interpolation between points. So I can basically encode this line as these four points and say it's a line. Yes. And they can have multi-lines. So I have sort of a set, a couple of these lines that, that all belong together. Yeah. For, instance, for instance, all the B roads in, in the province of Gelderland or something like that. And it can have uh, polygons. Yeah. So polygon, again, is some kind of a shape determined by a set of points. So it's essentially a ring that is closed, right? So the first point is identical to the last point. And a polygon is at least a ring, and it can have one or more holes. So it has zero or more <laughs> holes in it, right? So there can be an inner polygon and another inner polygon, and these are, uh, these are holes. So that is a single polygon, 
with potentially false. And I can have multiple of those, right? So if I have, for instance, uh, the set of polygons uh, of all the puzzles in my, in my uh, study region, then that would be a multi-polygon geometry, right? Those, so those six points, multi-points, lines, multi-lines, polygons, multi-polygons are the s kind of six key features. And then there's another one <coughs> that's of interest. Yeah? So if I have, for instance, the combination of a point and a line, yes? something I need to describe something, a geometry, and it consists of a line and a point, and that is called a geometry collection. Yes, geometry collection is a collection of zero or more of these things on the board. Yes. Interestingly, geometries can be empty. I said zero or more, so a geometry collection can be empty. I can even have uh, an empty line, which is a line with zero points. And, and if you start thinking about what that means, it's pretty abstract. Uh, they exist. So simple features is, uh, is a way, is a standardized way, and important is that it's um, standardized. Uh, so whether it's a good idea or not is not so important. The thing is that a lot of sort of environments outside of R represent their data by simple features. Yeah? So you can think of spatial databases. Let's say PostGIS. Who of you worked with PostGIS? Oh, okay. Nobody. Well, PostGIS is a common database where you have like um, geometry data represented as spatial data. There's many other SQLite, SpatialLite, uh, MySQL, sort of all relational databases have their extensions that deal with geometries, and they will all use simple features to store these things. Uh, GeoJSON, whoever ran into GeoJSON as a format? Yeah, some of you, yes. So GeoJSON basically has a constrained subset of simple features as their data uh, format. Um, other, you know, off the shelf GIS like ArcGIS will be able to deal with simple features and so on. So it is a, so this is a, um, an idea that sort of was introduced as a standard but became also pretty much grounded in the practice of dealing with spatial information as long as it's about features and simple features that basically convey polygon data, so points, lines, polygons, right? Um, now, we had in R, we had the, uh, let me see where I am. So here are some kind of semi-slides. Um, uh, right, the slides, so the slides, are, uh, the slides are here, but of course you don't see where here is um, or where their source is. So this is our markdown file, but this, it is on, um, ah, see them here, this doesn't bring much. Um, yes, yeah, so where are the slides? The slides are, uh, are on GitHub, yes, on GitHub under the directory me, first name, and then gsif. I thought gsif was a nice abbreviation of this activity. So you see the slides in the R markdown that I'm using now, uh, which was committed 10 minutes ago. So you see it's a fresh talk. Um, so um, we had, um, so yeah, so uh, we had, so I'm, I'm basically here now in this, uh, in this talk, right? So we had uh, in, um, in R, in R spatial, we developed this package SP, let's say, and we started doing that in 2003. So that is pretty much the pre-simple features time, right? It was at the same time that other people were writing this standard, so it wasn't published and it wasn't implemented, it wasn't used and so on. So we did that in a way that at that time, uh, we wrote SP in a way at that time was uh, convenient, yeah? So we thought, okay, the world is uh, points, lines, polygons, grids, and, and let's do that, right? And for the polygons part, for the lines part, we pretty much followed what was basically the standard model around back then, and that was that of the shape files. So, uh, and that turned out to be not such, uh, you know, an incredibly lucky choice because shape files have never been sort of, you know, fed with the strongest were probably not designed by the strongest thinkers of the earth, right? Um, so uh, simple features came up then, and um, we recently uh, decided to basically to, to re-implement uh, spatial data in terms of point lines polygons in uh, a package called F SF, which stands for simple features. And that does a couple of things. Yes, as I mentioned, these are the seven main types that simple features have. 
uh, it can also define points in two or three dimensions. Yeah, so it can have a third, a third, a, a z coordinate, so to speak, uh, and, a dim and a point can also uh, be four-dimensional and have a so-called m coordinate. Yes, m stands for a measured value. Yes, and it doesn't specify what this is, but it's not like a property of a polygon or something like that because that is a geometry attribute, yes? That is called a non-spatial. So it's really a property of a point. So you would have a polygon where each point in a polygon would have another sort of uh, property which you could, for instance, think of as an error measure of a GPS or something like that, or the time of measurement it is anyway. It's a number, yes? And it doesn't specify what the meaning of that number should be. There's just room for that, not much support. Um, as I said, simple refers to linear interpolation between points. Um, polygons are represented as an outer ring with zero or more inner ring, which is a very simple thing that, that shapefiles never, never came up with. And there are different encodings of these things. There's a text encoding, maybe somebody has ever seen this sort of phrase, line string with three points, meaning these are the three points with straight lines between them, that is the line. So that is the text encoding of a line string. And for all of the simple features, there are text encodings. And there are also binary encodings, which basically do a similar thing, but then in, in binary form. Yeah, as it says, I'm a, I have a it says I'm a, I have a certain endian, I have a certain type, and then I have so, so many points, and here are the points. Right? So it's very, very simple. But it's binary and extremely uh, efficient. It turns out to, if you use it, uh, it turns out to give you extremely fast I.O. Uh, between, for instance, databases, but also between libraries like RGDAL and uh, GEOS. So um, where are these simple features being used outside, sort of in the real world? Well, for instance, the GDAL library, that is the library that you all constantly use to read and write your raster data, right? Um, GDAL has a raster part, GDAL has a vector part, right? It was formerly called OGR, uh, and its data model is simple feature. Geos is another thing. If you ever sort of try to find the intersection of two polygons in R, you most likely have used R Geos for that, and that uses the Geos library. Geos library has simple features. Yes. LWGeom, lightweight Geom, is a library that basically encapsulates all the post GIS functionality, so it has a lot of more add ons than the things that GDAL and Geos do not have, but that post GIS do have, and they put it in a library that you can use. Uh, GeoJSON, as I said, is a format that has kind of a subset. The spatial databases, RGIS, GeoSparko, all use simple features. So there was, it was basically time to uh, rethink SP. And that's what we do. And so package SF, simple feature package, basically uh, replaces SP, RGDAL, and RGOs and says, <coughs> gone, right. Um, not that SP doesn't, didn't work well, yes, as we just saw, it still works and so on. You can use it and it will keep on, uh, keep on working. It's not that we suddenly drop support. But the main thing is that it doesn't implement simple features. And why is that so bad? Well, um, one reason is that you can't round trip data from other sources. Yeah, so if you have like a database and you want to sort of read your data into R and do something with it and put it back, then you put it back in a different format. Yes, because SP doesn't map, doesn't map this model. Yes, it, if there are geometry collections, it has to do something with it. If there are polygons, it will convert them into multi-polygons because SP only understands multi-polygons and multi-lines. It doesn't have single polygons, single lines. So that is not like, you know, that doesn't sound like a terrible problem, but somebody else will start complaining and say, hey, what's going on? Oh, I just used R, they say. Yeah, no, you messed up my database, yes, okay. Um, so, uh, and another sort of larger problem is the definition of polygon holes and where they are and where it's kept. That was uh, sort of not done, um, that was sort of done pretty ambiguous and convoluted, I would say. And uh, sort of, I blame, of course, Roger Bivend, who is responsible for part of the code of doing that, but also kind of the, 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 the it's also about the time that was written, this was written in because shapefiles were not really good in doing that. Um, SF, maybe more critically, um, works easily with the tidyverse. Has anyone of you heard of the tidyverse? Yes, some of, some of you, not very much, right? Okay, so I will be the first one about to talk about it. Um, 
The essence here is that we are that all these SP objects kind of derive from spatial. Spatial is kind of a superclass, and you get spatial points, spatial grids, spatial polygons, and so on. Uh, what SF does is that it extends data frames. So your data are simple data frames. So SP objects also look like data frames, yes, and behave like data frames in some way. At least we try to to make them behave like that, but they are not data frames, and that feels like a subtle difference until you run into trying to use software that actually wants data to actually be data frames, right? Enter Tidyverse, yes? So Tidyverse is basically, who of you uses RStudio? Yes, so everyone uses, so it's a wonder that you don't use our tidy, Tidyverse. So um, Tidyverse is a sort of a, Tidyverse used to be the Headley first. Headley is sort of the main person responsible for all this. He wrote his books, Advanced R, R Packages, a sort of excellent work, and uh, wrote an, a large number of all these, if not of, uh, really wrote all these packages. He could have written them all, essentially. Uh, but I wouldn't be responsible. Anyway, he doesn't do this completely uh, alone. But there's a large set of packages that basically make you do things with R and with these packages in a slightly different way than you're used to. So a lot of the things that are offered by these packages, basically you can already do with base R, right? But the argument here is that if you do them with these packages, it's easier. Yeah, so you start R and you load all these packages, sort of. So the package is really called tidy, it's really called tidyverse. So this is my R prompt, if I load it. No, you have to look better. <laughs> like this? this no, this should, this should be OK. You can read it in the back, right? Yeah, otherwise it falls off my screen. So here, I, lo I load the package Tidyverse. And here, it loads a large, you know, the Tidyverse favorites, packages, a lo lot of things. Uh, and it also says there's a couple of conflicts, yeah? So you will now use filter from dplyr, uh, meaning you will not, no longer, if you call filter, you will no longer call stats filter. So it even shields off a couple of things that are in, that are in base R. Um, and the, um, so who of you has used ggplot2? Okay, okay, now we are entering, sort of. Okay, so you're already using the tidyverse, right? So, um, and, Anyone use dplyr? Yes, 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 yes. So you're using it. Yes, it's just not used to the word yet. Yes. So it was used. It it was. People used to call it Hadleyverse, and then Hadley says, "No, I don't like that too much. It's too much, you know." And he called it tidyverse, sort of a year ago. Um, some of the th things, you know, there is there is. So there's pros and cons, of course, to that, right? Uh, because you think, hey, I already knew base R, and why should I, why should I learn this thing? A lot of these things are about sort of how your commands look like, yes? And it seems like, this seems like a moot point, right? Because if you can read it, you can read it, right? But a lot of things like, for instance, if you are subsetting data frames with the square bracket, um, yeah, how do you do that, right? So I have the data set. They always use the data set empty cars. Uh, so I have the data set empty cars. And I want to use sort of the select the cars that have six cylinders, right? So I have to say empty cars for which, and here I go, for I can't say for which cylinder is six, right? This doesn't work. And you think, eh, why can't this work, right? So of course you can then use subset uh, and say empty cars, cylinder is six. Oops, here we go. Yeah, so you can do it, of course, using another command, subset. Uh, but it is still, it is some kind of, so the, sub, the, the square bracket would requires you to sort of define where this is uh, and say uh, you have to specify this object because I c I'm not going to search automatically or something like that, right? Um, and now the plier has so sort of, you know, thought of this and said, 
okay, um, I'll do that somewhat differently um, and say, um, I think it's called fill. I'm not, I'm not a user of dplyr, so I have a hard time here. Empty cars uh, with cylinder is six. It's, it uses filter, yes, it says filter. And of course, filter then essentially does the same thing as subset. But um, so filter selects records. Um, uh, but it also has other things like uh, you could say, um, uh, for instance, mutate. So it means adapt empty cars and say uh, um, cylinder two is two times cylinder. Yes. And then. Yeah, and then take, for instance, the first few records. Uh, you see that I get an added column here, cylinder two, right? But you mutate, the nice thing here is you can continue working and say, okay, now I define cylinder two, and then I'm going to say, for instance, square root cylinder is the square root of from cylinder two, yes? And that also works, yes? And this is kind of, uh, it's, you know, they seem, they're like somewhat syntactical things, but this would never work with subset because basically this thing assumes that this expression has been evaluated and that this result is available to be put into there, right? So it, it kind of sort of adds up. And the idea is that if you can do these things, that it makes your life easier at the long run. Um, another aspect here is that um, is that we now do we have these kind of uh, convoluted sort of nested function calls, right? I I call a mutate, mutate, and then I call a head. And basically, what you do is uh, first uh, evaluate all these things, and then evaluate mutate, and then evaluate uh, head, right? So you work from the right to the left. Yeah? And if you do that with four four nested function calls, you also have to think of all these all these. Uh, um, sort of uh, braces and so on, and, and, and whether this works. And they thought, somebody thought of, um, basically inspired by the idea of Unix pipes, that that could be done easier. And these people said, okay, let's sort of uh, work from left to right. Let's start with empty cars and sort of pipe that into mutate and then uh, pipe that into head. Yeah, so this enter the pipes. Um, who has worked with pipes before? This kind of. Yes, it's good. Some of you have. So enter pipes. So we basically have an input data set, and that is input to a next, let's say, next process. Yeah, this is the thing that, that defines the cylinder two and, that, and, and, the, and the other thing. And that is then sort of put into this head function that prints the first six uh, um, uh, records instead of printing them all. And then you could go on and say, I'm going to write assign that to an output, yes? Or, I mean, I like that because it's kind of, it all goes to the right. But you see most people in this scene then say, no, I want to have this left assigned, yes? And use the left, use the left assign here. You will notice that I always use the is symbol because I have sort of, my background is C programming more than anything else. Um, so pipes and uh, and uh, these kind of and there and there's sort of a whole framework of so read um, if you want to look at sort of what what is sort of done there um, data science with R um, oh it's called R for data science another book written by uh, actually by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Gro Garrett Grolemund. Uh, is book R for data science that explains all these things and sort of analyzing tables and doing all these deep layer things and pipes and so on and, and so that is there and so so this sort of community s sort of you know makes a bit of a claim that that they do data science with R and this is the way you do data science I'm not sure that they don't claim that you shouldn't use base R but it kind of pushes you out of doing that um, there was some push from this, let's say, from the community doing all these things, liking these things. Uh, why can't we, you know, how does this work with, uh, with spatial data and with SP? Why can't we work with SP and these kind of things? And, 
it looked to some extent that that had to do with uh, SP using S4 classes and not sort of really working with data frames. How does this work with data frames? Um, yeah, so here, enter package SF. So is this readable, by the way, this kind of? Can you read it in the back? Tom has problems with his eyes. You can read it well? Yes? Good. Tom, you can sit here in the, you can sit here in front. You want it larger? Yeah? yeah? Good. I can try. I have problems with my eyes. That makes a good programmer. <laughs> if you say so. So, um, right, so enter package SF. So here you see that it loads the Geos, Tito, and Proch library and also lightweight geometry, although that will not work on a couple of like exotic platforms like Mac and Windows and so on, unless you go to, you know, some efforts. Uh, but that's not, that's not critical. That is sort of the main thing is the Geos and Tito, of course, and Proch. Uh, so here you see a couple of commands. Here you see how a point is created, right? So I simply have a point and what it prints then is sort of the well-known text uh, format of these things. And this is how I can define a line string. So a line string simply needs a matrix with three points. This is created by Arbind here and we see these three points, yeah? So this text form is not the form in which R stores it. It's just the form in which R prints it if you want to have it printed. Yes, it is stored as native R data. It's just a line string is simply a matrix. A point is simply a vector. And a multi-line string is a list of matrices. Yes, so a matrix is a set of points. And so it's simply, really simple R uh, data structures that are just printed in sort of the well-known text way. And you see that here, if I use str P, structure of P1, then you see it has these classes, uh, but it's simply a numeric vector with a value 0 and 1. And for the line, you see it's an XY, it's a matrix uh, with three rows and two columns with these six values in it. So these are simple, single geometries, right? So this is how I define them. This is something that you would never really do yourself because typically you import your data through GDAL from some database or from some file, shapefile, geo package or whatever. Um, now, I typically don't have a single geometry, right, but a collection of them because I have different, different things, data frames, and everything has a, has a, has a geometry. And now I'm creating uh, a set, right, of simple feature geometries. And here I have a set of two, of two points. And I do that with the function st sfc. So st underscore is basically uh, an, a prefix that all the functions in as if have, so if I do st underscore tab, then I get all the st underscore functions and you get a direct overview of all the functions that, uh, that sf basically exposes the, the user to, right? Uh, seems a little bit, you know, a little bit lot, but, but there's a lot of things that you don't and a lot of things that you at some stage will, uh, will recognize as, okay, this is geometry, this is uh, man, this is bookkeeping. Um, so SFC creates an SFC object, and it says, I have a geometry set for two features. Yeah? So this is multiple feature geometries, but just the geometries. And essentially what it creates here in P is a list of these two geometries. Yes, couldn't be as simple, but it, of course it has a class and it has a print method. So, and I also set the CRS here, so it will have a CRS and a bounding box. This is the things that spatial objects all, also all have. Yes, there is. One or two more things, it can also have a precision that later on allows you to control sort of the, the degree of rounding that is done before geometrical matches are being made that turns out to be extremely useful uh, in practice. So here I had only geometries. Now I have geometries with properties, right? So I have soil data, watch it, soil data here. Soil type, potzol, fluvisol. I've been searching the internet here. Uh, an elevation of these points, and then I have the geometry of these points. They turn out to be a very nicely rounded uh, degrees, latitude, longitude, world geodetic that exists in 84 uh, lying there, right? And you see that this object that I just created is an SF object, but it's also a data frame. So it is really a data frame. Yes, it's just, it's added, the classes SF is added so that you get a nice print of what's going on here, and you get kind of the geometry properties, but it is, 
really a data frame. No kidding. Yes. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have to be only a data frame, but if I start, let's say, oh, here it's created with STSF, but I can also start with things like tables or group data frames and make them into uh, SF objects. So how does this work? Enter the issue of list columns, right? So data frames can have, actually, uh, you think of data frames as tables, right? With rows records and columns variables. And columns can be heterogeneous, right? That is the classical way we think of them as sort of Excel tables or data or, or database <laughs> tables. Uh, but they, they can be more complicated, right? Here I created the data frame, you see, with the same uh, soil information. But I added a list column of some nonsense information where the first record has the numbers 1 and 2 and the second record has the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, so this makes it a pretty irregular thing, right? Um, I, was, I was here, yes. So we now have basically records that have multiple things and can be irregular. Yes, it's a list column. So the only thing constrained for a, the only st constraint for a data frame column is that it has a type list and it has length that's equal to the length of the other ones. Yeah? If I would put a, length, a column, sorry, a list of length three here in a data frame with two records, I get an error. But I put a list of length two and the list, this list has length two, yeah? um, I'm fine. And this is actually also how these geometry uh, lists works, right? P is, although we saw here that it's, it has a type, it is, uh, it is of an, it is of an, uh, uh, so, right, um, I could sort of run this whole thing. Um, RStudio is one of the other things that I really have to learn using. Um, Uh, there, is a, there is some command, run everything until here. Is this this one or so? Run all chunks above, yeah. So I was here. And then I have P. Uh, P, so if I ask what P is, actually, uh, well, it's an SFC point of length two, but uh, basically, so you could, uh, so P is basically a list, yes. Uh, sorry, as list, uh, I was going to ask, are you a list? Is list, yes, P is a list. Yes. Um, so uh, really the geometries are basically added as a list column here. And so you can also understand that they can have sort of mixed forms, various forms and mixed forms and so on. As I mentioned, I can have like a point and here a line string. The next thing is what you're going to do with those kind of data sets, but that is then the user's problem, right? Uh, now enter polygons. So here is a uh, polygon data set, the North Carolina data set that is also used a lot in, in uh, examples and so on. Um, and that is uh, read as a geo package here. So geo pack who has heard of geo package here? Okay, so then I might sort of uh, make you happy with the message here that geo package is sort of the succeeder of shapefile. This two package is a better shape file, so to speak. So it's a, it's a database and a file. Yes, it's, it's a file. The file is a database. You can open it with SQLite. It's an SQLite database, and it has tables in it and so on, and you can mess around with it as, as much as you want, uh, except that when you really mess it up, then it's no longer a geo package. But if it's a geo package, it has a certain structure, so we know where sort of which table contains the information about the coordinate reference system and all these kind of things. Yeah, that is good. And uh, GDAL can read and write them very well, very fast. So here data are being read and here we can say that a variable area is uh, plotted for this North Carolina data set. Uh, and the good news is that we also have 40 simple feature objects. So you see here ST read, reads it, uh, reads a geo package, nothing else. Yeah, so it understands that. Um, and that it, there is also um, nicely a geom SF um, geometry, I think it's called a geometry, a, a geom, it's called a geom, I think, in ggplot. 
uh, to uh, that uh, plots uh, simple features. Yeah, so here is a plot and, and C, plot is simple feature object, and then it also takes the, oh no, I say fill is area, so it takes the area variable uh, and plots these things. And uh, the nice thing is that you get these graticules for free, uh, so the white lines now have a certain meaning, yes, they are no longer just straight lines, they are actually graticules, although they look straight, they are not. Uh, and they have sort of these uh, degrees north and west and so. So the code to, to compute these graticules uh, and to sort of give these symbols is actually coming from SF and being reused by, by ggplot. So we had some, some sort of uh, serious uh, uh, involvement there with, uh, with the developer of ggplot2, Hadley Wickham. Here's another example of a world map data set that is taken from the library maps and that is here converted into a simple features object and then plotted. Uh, you see these uh, the, the graticules, although their placement might not be really optimal. Uh, and here you see that they're transformed into a Lambert equal area projection uh, that basically centers everything uh, around uh, the South Pole, the Antarctic. And you see that these graticules also modify, so they're still, they're still graticules. They're not just, it would be pretty useless to have sort of wide horizontal and vertical lines sort of as a background for this, uh, for this plot. So this works nicely. So ggplot2 has also some, uh, in that sense, some serious ambitions and already reached some serious milestones in uh, support for, for spatial data. Uh, other things that I pointed out here is, uh, is for instance, the uh, geometrical, so the geos operations uh, that I use a function here that is called strelate. Um, ST relate is um, is a function that um, computes the relationship between who of you ever used G relate from RGOS? Okay, uh, who ever used ever G intersection from RGOS? Yes, some of you. Good. So ST relate computes the relationship between two geometries, right? So the geometries are here the set of these geometries, the North Carolina states. So some of them touch each other, right? But they might touch each other uh, in, let's say, along a line. And some of them touch each other like here, they touch each other in a point, right, really. Uh, if you have like grid, grid data, you have of course all kind of, you know, you always have like four line touches and you have eight sort of uh, line or point touches. Um, so that is this idea of how, what the dimension of, of an intersection is, has been worked out in this uh, um, dimensionally extended ninth intersection model, which is a sort of a very sort of common and well understood uh, model for uh, how two geometries intersect. And it basically looks at two geometries here, the purple and the green one, and it says, okay, each of them has an inner side has a boundary and has an outside, right? Both have that. So I can make a three by three table, inner side, boundary, outside of the one, inner side, boundary, outside of the other one, and get nine combinations. Yes, I have nine possibilities that I can look at, and each of these possibilities can be anything of empty, being no, nothing, right? Empty set, or can be a point, meaning one, uh, zero dimensional, or can be sort of one-dimensional, linear, or can be an area, two-dimensional. So for each of the nine points, and if I sort of list that up, so four possibilities for nine sort of combinations, you basically get all the possible uh, intersections, you know, relations between polygons you could have. Uh, that is being explained here, uh, and it is a model that is basically uh, implemented here as a possible outcome that corresponds to these two intersections, for instance. Uh, and from that, you can do everything. You can basically say, well, are two geometries equal, disjoint, do they touch, does one contain the other, does one con con cover the other, do they intersect, and so on. So all the predicates are basically, can be expressed in terms of this logic. Uh, but not sort of this logic, so, so as you saw here, we have all these predicates here, we have like uh, uh, S, ST covers, ST covered by, ST um, equals, 
Uh, yeah, so all these things are kind of functions on their own. Uh, but here is a problem that I could not solve that way, and that is that of the rook neighbors. That is basically the neighbors that only touch each other, right? So I can do a simple intersection, but then I get the polygon with itself, which I don't want. That's not a neighbor, that's the polygon itself. But I want the neighbors that, uh, that basically touch the, the elements. Uh, and I can do that by ST relate and define a pattern similar to the co covers equals and so on. So that's done like this. Uh, and then you can sort of on the fly define a function like this and run the function. Here this is done in the dplyr syntax and say, okay, uh, use this nc and put it in mutate and compute a n bay rook uh, by basically the st rook that I just combined, uh, defined here in terms of the st relate and a pattern of the, of the dimension, the uh, uh, extended nine intersection model that I just showed you. And then you get these neighbors, right? And here you see nb rook as a column showing up. So for the first polygon, I have these neighbors, rook neighbors. A rook is the chess thing. That's the thing that can only go up and down, left and right. Um, and here are these neighbors. And these sort of neighbors could be sort of the input for a next modeling where you do some conditional or regressive model or some spatial regression or something like that, right? Um, OK, that was what I wanted to do this show about um, simple features. Yeah, so other things that uh, sort of, uh, so I wrote it, started writing that basically after the last USR conference, which was in July, so that started uh, really in, I think in September or something like that. Now we are, uh, now we are June, there has been a lot of, um, um, I'm sorry, we're now May. There has been a lot of uh, response to this package in the sense that uh, a lot of uptake, a lot of users, a lot of uh, um, uh, people asking questions. So previously, all these questions were in the Arctic Geo mailing lists. You s now see everywhere that mailing lists kind of kind of go down. And this package was developed in, in on GitHub, not on Rforge, uh, and that sort of helped a lot. It seems that the whole data science community uses GitHub, and I think there are. I would roughly estimate something like 2,000 issues, sort of messages from people and answers uh, on, on this, just on this GitHub page, right? So that is uh, maybe more than, than the traffic on Arctic Geo for the last year, potentially. Yeah, definitely more. So, uh, so if you, you know, you can, you can look at these things and, and uh, browse them and, um, um, see what is going on and, and so go to the issues and this is only the open issues there are as you see there are 250 ones closed and varying but there are you know ones with like lots of uh, lots of uh, comments and discussions discussions about how to integrate deployer with simple features and so on and and all kind of things so uh, if you have issues it makes sense to first search here in the search bar for the for existing issues and and read those and and sort of uh, add to that or, or start new issues. A lot of people just start new issues because they're too lazy to, uh, to do that. Um, so that is, so GitHub is one of these things. Uh, Twitter is another one of these things. Data science kind of people communicate a lot over Twitter. So anytime I release things, I tweet things and it's sort of, there's an enormous sort of, uh, uh, you know, reactive, fast reactivity and people, you know, people, generate cool graphics and show that and some anima animation or something show the, do that on Twitter and a lot of lot of response and so on I mean it's you could say it's hollow but it's also pretty fast and, and in some sense uh, convenient um, to finish off this is kind of uh, uh, this was a nice attempt right and it's sort of a successful project I think that it's really going to replace uh, SP although that might take a few years there is this graph that I wanted to show you about the SP verse, um, uh, where was it, SP verse, SP verse, right, here is an, uh, here is an plot of the not showing, Oh, it's not there. There it is. So here's a here's a plot, a, sort of a clustering 
of all the 10,000, over 10,000 packages on CRON. CRON is not everything, but it's a lot. And you see that there are certain clusters to do with web services, graphics, interfaces, and, and older books. And there's the SP verse, right? There's a whole cluster of packages reusing SP. So there's a lot of spatial on, uh, on CRON reusing SP. And we don't think that that will go away soon. But uh, SF is definitely um, the sort of has more of a, a future and, and solves a lot of people, a lot of people's problems today, especially people working with the uh, tidyverse. Um, now you might wonder, like, OK, point science polygons, I mostly use with, with grid data, with raster data, and with the raster package and so on. So what's going on there? So raster has, of course, the same somewhat issue that it has its own data formats. It's strongly linked to SP. It uses S4 and so on. It's very difficult to combine it with, uh, uh, with dplyr and tidyverse. Uh, other limitations are that it's basically your data have to be on disk, right? You can't sort of have distributed computing through whatever, through multiple machines. It's very mm -hmm. difficult. Um, the raster stack is basically a stack of rasters where the stack can be either multiple attributes or multiple time, but not a combination of those, right? You can't have multiple attributes and time, like uh, spectral and, and time series or something like that. So it, it stops there. Uh, we wrote together with two previous um, Together with two previous uh, authors of uh, or contributors to uh, to the raster packages, I wrote a new proposal that has now been uh, granted by has been is being funded by the R consortium. That's called Scalable Spatiotemporal Tidy Arrays for R uh, or Stars. Um, that is thought of as kind of a longer term uh, follow up way to follow up raster, uh, not only doing raster maps but also in primarily sort of principle also time series of features, yes? If you would have features and time series, right, where do you put them? It doesn't work any longer in a data frame unless you repeat all the features, which for polygon data is, of course, a nightmare, right? So you want to be able to work with uh, arrays, which can be matrices or higher dimensional arrays. And the idea here is to sort of uh, work with the metaphor of data frames still, but on the other hand, also implement sort of higher dimensional arrays, multi-dimensional uh, multi uh, dense arrays, so that could be raster images or stacks of raster images or multi-attribute raster time series, four-dimensional arrays, uh, and, and integrate that in a useful way with, uh, with simple features. And then you immediately come with the problem that, of course, that doesn't fit all in memory, so you need to do something that, that basically Deplier also does with databases, that you have proxy objects work on them, develop on them, and basically at some stage when you think, uh, well, how would this look like when I did it on the complete data set, then you carry it out on the complete data set and go home and sort of return back a couple of days later and see how that worked out, right? This is the issue of basically Sentinel and Sentinel-2 and so on. How on earth do we get these data in our analyses? Downloading is not an option. Uh, so this is a, a proposal. This is just in proposal form, and you can have a look at it. It's on uh, GitHub, uh, adser slash stars, and there's a, there's a proposal so you can get an idea of what we have in mind to sort of bring to you in about a year time, if this would go as fast as uh, simple features. I think the problem is somewhat more tricky, but let's see where we get. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions?